All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week so far. We have a really fun show today. We're going to be hitting on the Elite Eight games last night in the NCAA Women's Tournament. Highly, highly entertaining stuff. Lots of debate about how Kim Mulkey and LSU decided to guard Caitlin Clark. So I dove into the film and have a bunch of thoughts on uh, what I would have done, mostly just talking about the pros and cons of different types of coverages and the realities of dealing with a player of, of Caitlin Clark's caliber, and just some information from the stuff that I pulled on tape. Uh, after that, we're going to talk about the Phoenix Suns going into New Orleans and smacking the Pelicans. How unusual is this? Devin Booker has played the Pelicans twice this year and has two 52-point games against them. Kind of uh, rare to see something like that. And then at the end of the show, we got you know five or six mailbag questions that we'll be hitting that go around the league. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss any show announcements or film threads. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops Tonight. It's also super helpful if you leave a rating and a review on that front. And last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions in the YouTube comments. We're going to do a few more mailbags over the course of this week. So 41 points, 7 rebounds, and 12 assists against the team that knocked you out in the title game last year. Not just defeating the defending champion, the champion, but avenging a loss to the team that beat you and did it in resounding fashion. An unbelievable performance by Caitlin Clark against LSU. Now, here's the question. Caitlin Clark was cooking against LSU, obviously, and seemed to be making it look easy for most of the night. And so there was a lot of question about whether or not LSU had the right defensive strategy to deal with Caitlin Clark. And that was especially apparent when we saw the second game and we saw Juju Watkins of USC getting very aggressive coverages from UConn and Gino Ariema. So it presented this question of whether or not that was the appropriate way to deal with what Caitlin Clark was doing. And so what I did to kind of uh, try to come at this with as much information as possible is I went back and I charted every single pick and roll and ISO that Caitlin Clark ran in this game. She ran seven ISOs and 18 pick and rolls. The ISOs were pretty few and far between, and they were more or less the same thing. Uh, she hit up uh, ISO three against Haley Van Lith, where she gave her a little bit too much space, which was really the only possession that I didn't think Haley did a good job. I thought for the most part, Haley did a really good job within the scheme. It was the scheme that was getting burned, not Haley. But for the most part in the ISOs, Caitlin was beating her man off the, her uh, her defender off the dribble and then running into all of LSU's size at the rim and it so it wasn't really the best strategy pick and roll was the best way for her to at least get the rim protectors a little bit further away from the basket namely Angel Reese right so Caitlin ran 18 pick and rolls total including passes and Iowa got 19 points out of them now that's 1.06 point per possession which seems low compared to or mediocre compared to some NBA numbers but at the college level that's insane uh, that just just by looking at the uh over the season numbers this year uh uh uh, uh, uh when it comes to Caitlin Clark and the way she stacks up against other pick and roll ball handlers, that's about where she was for most of the season, including passes. And that was in the very top tier of pick and roll ball handlers around the country. So like that's excellent, especially in the NCAA tournament, which by the way, Caitlin Clark is getting almost 1.3 points per possession in pick and roll in this NCAA tournament when she shoots the basketball. So she's been cooking in these particular situations, shooting over 60% herself. Right? So, I saw uh, four different coverages in pick and roll from LSU in this game. And then there were uh, three possessions where she rejected the screen entirely. So we didn't get to see what the coverage means. What that means is screens coming on this side, but instead she drives the other direction and just it effectively turns into an ISO at that point. Uh, the four different coverages that I saw was going underneath the screen without nail help, meaning there's not help waiting on the other side of the screen. And then going under the screen with nail help and then over the screen with drop and over the screen with a hedge. Now, again, the drop is the screen defenders hanging back in the lane. Now, LSU was kind of hovering around the kind of like semicircle area just below the foul line. So it wasn't a super deep drop. They were there to try to contest a little bit, but they were sitting back. They were not up at the level of the screen for the most part. There were uh, to, to kind of go through them one by one. So under without help, there were four possessions. These were all early in the game. And every single one of them, Caitlin Clark took 
a pull-up three. There were four of these possessions. Caitlin took a pull-up three on every single one of them. She made two of them. So it was 1.5 points per possession in four possessions or six points in four possessions. Early in the game, there was a uh, a possession where Kate Martin was uh, Kate Martin was on the left wing, and Flau J. Johnson actually j- uh, jumped down in nail help. Meaning, as Caitlin came off the screen, Flau J. was waiting for her at the nail. Caitlin just made a simple swing pass to Kate Martin, who's been a deadly unguarded three point shooter all season. According to Synergy, she was at forty three percent on unguarded catch and shoot jump shots, which is right where she's at for the entire NCAA tournament as well. She made the three. They didn't try that again the rest of the game. No more nail help. Because what they would do is they would just keep Kate Martin on the wing one pass away from where they were running those ball screens. So if you helped, you were just leaving a really good shooter wide open. So they tried that once, burned for three points. So it's three points per possession in one possession. The most frequent coverage they used was just a traditional drop coverage with Haley Van Lith chasing over the top of the screen. And they had a good amount of success there. It stopped Caitlin from taking pull-up threes, uh, mainly turned her into a passer, and a lot of those pocket passes were either turning into turnovers or shots at the rim against length that were missed. They scored seven points in eight possessions there. That's 0.88 points per possession. So the general coverage they used for the majority of the game actually worked pretty well. Then uh, there were two possessions late in the game when Caitlin really started to get going where they offered a hedge. Now that means Angel Reese, as the screen was being set, was coming up and hedging just to stop Caitlin from taking the three. High drop hedge, whatever you want to call it. Coming up to the level of screen, bothering, and then rotating back to the basket. On those two possessions, they both resulted in pocket passes and uh, one was a turnover and one was a missed layup. So that was zero points per possession on two possessions. And then the three times that she rejected the screen, meaning she didn't use the screen, but she drove away from it. She had a driving and one layup and then she had two misses. So three points in three possessions or one point per possession. So honestly, when you look back at it, it was a lot of really small sample size stuff, like three of the coverages, they only used three possessions or less. And then the main coverage they used actually worked pretty well. On tape, Haley Van Lith did her job. When she was going under the screen early, it was very clear that that was actually the coaching staff's decision because other defenders that ended up on Kate for random possessions ended up going underneath as well. That was what they were doing at the beginning of the game. That's not Haley's fault. And it was a bad idea. If there was one thing to really shine the light on in in this particular game, it was the early game possessions when they were going underneath screens. That didn't make any sense. But when Haley was chasing over the top, she was doing a good job. She was staying attached. She was fighting over the top of screens. There were several possessions where Caitlin came off on the other side of the screen and Haley's just right there waiting for her. She did her job. It was mainly just a product of the coverage that the openings that were there ended up being there. So the question is, this was the most frequent one I see. What was the one coverage that I did not mention in that list? A blitz. So a blitz is where you have Haley Van Lith chase over the top and you have Angel Reese hard hedge and both of them try to trap Caitlin and basically force her to immediately get rid of the basketball. LSU did not do this a single time in the game. So the question is why? Why didn't LSU try blitzing? To me, when I look at it, the reality of LSU's defensive scheme, the way that they're set up, Angel Reese is one of their best rim protectors, if not their best rim protector. She had three blocks in this game. They want to keep her at the rim. It's the same reason why you might not necessarily want to blitz with a Brooke Lopez. The way uh, the way that Adrian Griffin, not well, Adrian Griffin wasn't necessarily blitzing, but he was bringing Brooke Lopez way up high to the level of the screen to start the season. The same reason why you don't want to do that is that's just not a the best use of of what Brooke does well defensively. Same thing for Angel Reese. Now, Angel Reese is a player that can force a lot of turnovers and cause a lot of problems. I would have personally tried blitzing, but my guess is Kim Mulkey's thought was, I want to keep Angel Reese as close to the rim as possible. And again, the hedge worked, but it was in a really small sample size. They did it two possessions, both late in the game. If you start the game hedging or blitzing, or you go to the hedge or blitz early in the game and you stick with it, there's a chance that Iowa just gets going a different way. You're going to be running four on threes on the back end with Angel Reese 20 plus feet away from the basket, right? And again, like in a small sample, it might work. But in a large sample, eventually there's like a tic-tac-toe that forms. The players on the floor kind of figure out the reads and they can get going out of that and get really easy shots. My guess is Kim Mulkey was thinking, 
I'd rather just see if Caitlin can make enough shots. I want to see if we can fatigue her and wear her down, especially because we play physical. We attack the offensive glass. I think she wanted to wear Caitlin down and see if she was capable of making enough shots, and she got burned. And by the way, you can get burned the other way. This is where I want to use Steph Curry as an example. Steph Curry in the 2022 finals against the Boston Celtics primarily faced a high drop coverage. But in that drop coverage, because Steph can shoot so deep, a lot of times Al Horford and Robert Williams were coming out to 20, 22 feet, but Steph was hitting pull-up threes at 24, 26 feet. And Steph burned them. Namely, in game four, Steph burned the deep drop, made a ton of shots, and it cost them the series. And a lot of people were like, why are they running drop? Including myself. Mainly just because I wanted to see them mix things up and try something different. And here's the reality. You go back to 2015 against the Cleveland Cavaliers in the finals, they go, we're sick of watching Steph hitting all these pull-up threes against Matthew Della Vadova. We're going to blitz. And so they did. And when they blitzed, it turned out Steph was really good at getting the ball over the top to Draymond Green on the roll. Turns out Draymond Green is really good at rolling down the lane and making decisions. And it turns out Andre Iguodala and everyone else on that roster is really smart on the backside as cutters and as corner three-point shooters and things like that. And it burned the Cavs. So again, like when we look at this, it's like, why didn't they blitz? Why didn't they blitz? Why didn't they blitz? Well, Caitlin's an elite passer as well. And that just might burn you in the same way. And so again, like if there's anything to be really critical of, I felt like she should have mixed things up more. It should have been, here's a random blitz. Here's a possession of zone to kind of throw things off. Here's a, 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 a classic drop coverage possession. Here on this possession, we're going to, you know, deny the screen and try to funnel her into help on the other side. Whatever it is, hard nail help, you know, uh, uh, pre-switching, putting a guard on the big girl as she goes up to set the screen so that you can just switch that screening action. There's so many different things you can do. And for the most part, it was the it was like they went under to start the game and then they went over late in the game and there was never really much help. There were a handful of hedges in there, but that's really it. There just wasn't enough in terms of mixing it up to try to make Caitlin do different stuff on every possession. Because again, once you get comfortable, once you know what the coverage is and you're facing it every time down the floor, you kind of just get in a rhythm going against that particular coverage. And this is honestly just the classic question when you're dealing with this type of player, this particular type of player, the elite scorer who is also an elite playmaker. And playmaker is the operative word there because Juju Watkins of USC, she can, she's an elite scorer, but she had 140 turnovers this year to just 112 assists. So for UConn, it actually made more sense to be a lot more aggressive with her. Like that is the coverage you want to do against that particular type of player because you want to test her playmaking ability. There's a player in the third quarter of that game where she came off of a ball screen and Paige Beckers came over with hard nail help, like full-on double, walled up on her, hard double team. And Juju just shot over the top of it. That same type of nail help happened in the first quarter of the LSU-Iowa game, and it was Flaugh J. Johnson that came over and Caitlin Clark made the pass and Kate Martin made the shot. That's the difference. You can get away with a lot of those really aggressive coverages against a player that's a lesser playmaker. It's By the way, it's the same kind of thing we talk about with like Kevin Durant, right? Like if you're playing the LeBron Luka types, a lot of coaches are like, make them score. Maybe they'll get tired. And they don't want to get in the blender of those guys as playmakers picking you apart. But then you go up against the, you know, Kevin Durant, Kobe Bryant types. You want to throw as much defensive attention at them as possible and play into what makes them uncomfortable, which is being a passer, right? And so again, like I, I, I'm not even necessarily saying that uh, when it comes to Juju Watkins, that's the only way you could uh, you could play against a player like that. I'm just saying, like in you're looking at two different types of players. The elite scorer, they were throwing the kitchen sink at her. The elite scorer and playmaker, they tried to dare her to beat them scoring the basketball, and they lost. And again, like it, there's, it's very possible that they could have tried more aggressive coverages and lost anyway. If, if anything, it, it's likely, given the amount of talent and just the reality of trying to defend in a four-on-three every single possession down the floor. And again, my one complaint is I would have mixed it up more. And that was one of the things UConn was doing. UConn against USC, they were run and drop on some possessions. They were offering nail help on some possessions and not on others. They were blitzing on some possessions. They were hard doubling on some possessions. It was all mixed up, and it did a better job of keeping her off balance. One other note with LSU 
Angel Reese was 7 for 19 on shots in the paint, all on attempts that were right around the rim. She's shooting 49.3% at the rim for this entire season, including both tournaments, and below 40% in this NCAA tournament. She missed 12 shots in this particular game right around the rim. I thought that was probably the biggest factor in the game. I mean, we talked so much about the defense, like I talked about, on a per-possession basis, they did a good job defensively. The, obviously, the box score numbers look big, and the lead was big, but the reality was is the problem for LSU was they were missing too many shots around the rim, and that was a consistent theme throughout the season. Caitlin Clark shoots in the mid-60s at the rim. Angel Reese shoots below 50% at the rim, right? And like, and, and that just ended up being the thing that kind of stalled them out offensively. Now, what do I expect to see in the Final Four, at least in the UConn-Iowa game, because those are the two teams that I've watched more closely? Um, I expect Gino Ariema to bring just a better mix of coverages. I think you will see blitzes. I think you will see hard hedges. I think you will see hard nail help. You're going to see all of that, but it's going to be mixed in an attempt to keep uh, Iowa off of balance and to keep Caitlin Clark off balance. I also think uh, UConn has a a few more lengthy defenders on the perimeter that will make things a little more interesting. Obviously, LSU's interior size is kind of their advantage. I think we're going to see just a little bit more length on Caitlin Clark as well. It's going to be a real challenge, and it's going to be a really fun game. We do plan on covering the women's Final Four on this show. It should be fun. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here, and DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. UConn is currently the favorite to win the title at plus 500. My favorite team, hometown Tucson, Arizona Wildcats, are currently plus 1,300. Plenty of good bets to check out. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. The crown is yours. Moving on to Suns Pelicans. This game was crazy. The Suns just lit them up from the opening tip. They had 14 points in the first two minutes and 58 seconds on pace for damn near a 60-point quarter. They were consistently getting the Pelicans in rotation. A lot of the same stuff that I've talked about with the Suns where you just inevitably end up drawing in help and then you're playing drive and kick basketball with just incredibly talented offensive players. They were uh, The Pelicans were making a lot of mistakes early in this game. Devin Booker and Kevin Durant each got two wide open jumpers in the opening minutes. There was a Nurkic offensive rebound that got Devin Booker a wide open 15-footer. There was a, a play on the left wing where uh, Herb Jones was prepping for a, a, a specific type of coverage and wasn't paying close enough attention to his man, Devin Booker, on this play. And Devin Booker got a wide open corner three just because he was a step late. Uh, KD got two wide open kickouts uh, because his man got pulled into help situations. All four of these jumpers went in. That was a big part of, uh, excuse me, KD made one and missed the other. But like three of those four jumpers went in. They got into rhythm pretty quickly. They just kept leaving Devin Booker open after that. We talked about the two mistakes early, but Devin Booker's next three out of that that he made came in a stack pick and roll situation. So stack pick and roll is when Devin Booker's coming off of the Nurkic ball screen. But as he's coming off of the Nurkic ball screen, Grayson Allen underneath the basket is coming up and back screening Nurkic's man so that he can get open on the roll. The way the Pelicans were guarding it was Zion Williamson was guarding Grayson Allen. And so what Herb Jones and, and, and Zion Williamson were doing is they were switching that Grayson Allen, Devin Booker element. So basically, uh, 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 Zion Williamson will have to split out and guard Devin Booker, and Herb Jones would essentially take... Uh, um, Grayson Allen as he's flashing to the top of the key. And in both of these situations, Zion Williamson is closing out at Devin Booker, right? So it's a difficult defensive matchup for him just by the way the coverage is set up. They're basically pulling Zion into this ball screen situation, right? So Booker's next three came out of a stack pick and roll situation where Zion was supposed to switch out, but he was too late. Devin Booker made the three. They ran another stack stack pick and roll a few possessions later. This time, Zion comes out hard. This was on the left side of the floor. Zion comes out hard, but it's a bad closeout. Devin Booker goes right by him and gets an easy layup. And by the way, this is one of the many reasons why I don't take the Pelicans very seriously as a playoff threat. Regardless of what the defensive numbers look like, their defensive front court is bad. And good offenses are going to find a way to score easily against them, just like the Suns uh, Suns did. There was another three in there on the left wing where they left Devin Booker wide open in transition where they just weren't matched up. There were tough shots in there too. Devin hit a step back three in the first quarter at the top of the key. 
But like he's in full rhythm at that point. That there's not really much you can do to stop a player once he's that confident and in that kind of groove. So uh, four minutes left in the first quarter. The Pels bench group comes in and they start... Uh, or this is before the bench came in. Four minutes left in the first quarter. The Pels are trying to slow down Devin Booker at this point. So they start blitzing it. As soon as they start blitzing Devin Booker, the Suns score eight points immediately on the next three possessions. Eric Gordon, corner three in the right corner. Grayson Allen, corner three in the left corner. And then a Grayson Allen closeout opportunity from the left wing where he drives and gets a nasty dunk, like a posterizing dunk. So, like, no matter what they did, they were just in the blender. Late first quarter, the Pels bench group comes in. And I don't know how this happened, but somehow Zion Williamson drew the Devin Booker assignment in this bench group. Devin Booker took him through one simple flare screen and got another wide open three. We're not even 10 minutes into this game. Devin Booker has 19, and the Suns are up by 21 points, and the game is over. This was an unserious effort from the New Orleans Pelicans. Yusuf Nurkic was just ignoring Jonas Valanciunas and trolling the paint, which stopped Zion's dribble penetration and really bogged down their offense. Obviously, Brandon Ingram being out plays a factor there, right? The Pelicans are a statistically good defense. They're sixth in defensive rating on the season and fourth post all-star break, but I don't actually think they can guard any of the good offenses in any sort of serious game. Their front court players can't guard in space. They kind of require a certain type of matchup for their wing defenders to be able to impact things enough for them to kind of hold down an elite defense. They need to be able to kind of like load up on a singular player. Anything that can really spread them out is going to put them in a lot of trouble. Um, On the Suns front, it's no secret that they need Devin Booker to be at this level, to be where they need to be offensively. Devin Booker had been struggling coming back from the ankle injury, shooting just 48% from the field and 28% from three in the 10 games before last night, just 24 points per game as well. And you saw the offense struggle a little bit, a little bit particularly in the Oklahoma City game and the San Antonio game, even struggled a little bit against Denver. They just won that game. Uh, but they broke out in a big way in this game, and the Suns' offense broke out with him. But the Suns have a absolute murderer's row here to end the season. Their next seven games before we get into the playoffs are Cleveland, Minnesota, New Orleans again, who's going to want revenge, uh, cl- the Clippers twice, the Kings, and the Timberwolves. Now, I think the Suns are good enough to do well in a lot of those games. Also, just from personal experience, having rooted for the Lakers last year, urgency plays a major role here. Like, Cleveland doesn't have the urgency because they have a locked-in playoff spot that the Suns do. Minnesota doesn't have the urgency because they have a locked-in playoff spot that the Suns do. New Orleans, they're obviously still in some sort of vague threat to drop into the play-in, but they're in better position than most of these teams, right? So they're less threatened, right? The Clippers, obviously, same sort of thing. They want to play better basketball. They have some motivation, but they're not threatened the way that Phoenix is. Sacramento, they're, they're, that's going to be a, 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 a tough game, but Sacramento obviously is down two of their most important players. And then the Minnesota Timberwolves, same thing. Like uh, at the end of the season, just like uh, they, they play them earlier in the stretch as well, but same sort of thing, not really jockeying for position. So they have a huge urgency advantage in a lot of these games. So I actually, if I had to guess uh, on a team dropping down into the 9 10 and letting the Lakers pass, I actually think it's more likely that it ends up being Sacramento than Phoenix because Sacramento has the same type of urgency, but they've got also a tough schedule and they're missing some important players. I think the Suns are really freaking good. And I think when they play that hard and they bring that level of urgency, it's really tough to beat them. All right, moving on to our mailbag. So, uh, the, uh, the context for this first question, we had a, uh, I had a, uh, an opportunity at the end of the show or at the end of the Mavs segment yesterday to talk about where I'd rank them in the Western conference. And I made the case that all of the teams that are in that tier. So like the Suns, the Clippers, the Lakers, the Thunder and the Timberwolves, all those teams are more or less just as formidable. And so I I don't think Dallas has done anything to separate from that group. So that that's the context of this first question. The uh, Here's the question. The case for the Mavs in a tier of their own in the West below Denver is Luka. He's the only player who has a chance shot for shot with Jokic late in a game. And when Luka isn't giving you tough, unstoppable buckets, Kyrie is. Suns come close to that firepower, but it's not the same. Respectfully, I disagree. I think all of these teams, except if there's one team that you could say Luka is just clearly better than the Stars by a wide margin and it's not close, it's Luka's better than Anthony Edwards, right? And even then, Anthony Edwards could break out any one of these postseason runs and enter into that tier, right? But obviously, with Luka and Kyrie, the star power is just better. But like the Suns have Kevin Durant, uh, uh, Bradley Beal, and Devin Booker. Devin Booker just had 52 last night. Like, I'm sorry, but there's not a 
tangible gap between Luka and Kyrie and KD, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal. On the Clippers front, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, and James Harden. On the Lakers front, LeBron James and Anthony Davis and all their skill that they have on the perimeter. Oklahoma City, Shea Gildas Alexander and Jalen Williams. Like I, 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 I could, you could argue that Luka is the best player in that group. I think it's probably him and Kawhi uh, in terms of playoff players, and I'd probably give a slight edge to Luka. So I agree with you that Luka is probably the best, but there's not a sizable star power gap between any of those guys and uh in the Luca Kyrie duo. Not they're not anything that's worth really mentioning. There's probably a small gap there, but nothing that's really going to be substantial when you get to the postseason. So again, really like Dallas playing the best basketball right now, which is a huge indicator of their potential playoff success. But I push back on the idea that they're just superior to to all of the teams in that tier. Question for the best breakdown pot in the game. Thank you. That's a very nice compliment. Do you think there's a chance Tatum is saving his legs on drives to the basket for the playoffs like a running back in football? He's shown some bad habits this year, but I find it hard to believe that he forgot his biggest flaw from the 2022 finals. So here's the thing. I do think that there's some reality to the fact that you are more physically engaged when the urgency goes up and Boston is not bringing that type of urgency. That said, I've never known Tatum to be the guy that's like, oh, the chips are down. I'm playing bully ball now. So from that standpoint, like I do think there's a level of aggression that he'll have when he gets to the postseason, but not in some massive way that significantly changes his shot diet compared to what we're accustomed to seeing. Next question. I'm a big fan from Australia, and I've been watching since your first playoff breakdowns in 2022. Thanks for supporting the show. My question, fast forward five years. Oklahoma is the new dynasty in the NBA. SGA, Chet, and J-Dub are all still there, but who are the first, second, and third players in uh, on that particular team, in your opinion? I've heard you say both Chet and J-Dub have top 10 potential, and you have also expressed concerns over SGA's game translating to the playoffs. So do you think the best version of the Thunder is SGA as a second option? Here's the thing. It's really hard to say. Chet's playing his first season of NBA basketball and Jalen Williams is playing his second season. So Shea Gildas Alexander has played twice as many NBA seasons as the other two guys combined. So like, it's just really hard to tell where Chet and Jalen are going to get to. But here's the thing. I think SGA is a definitive top 10 player right now, right? I think you can make a case he's top five, although I would wait to do that until he has a successful postseason run. But here's the thing. Chet has the potential to be a top five defensive player in the league and a top 10 ish offensive player in the league as just a guy that can be this wing scorer slash stretch big kind of guy, right? Like he has the sky's the limit for that guy. And then I talked yesterday on the show, we're going to get a little bit deeper into it here in a second, but Jalen Williams, I think has the best combination of downhill force, deadly pull up shooting and playmaking that I've seen from a wing prospect in a very long time. So he has the potential to be one of the best players in the NBA. So honestly, like it's not really about who's first, second, or third. They play complementary positions, right? Like J-Dub is a second side creator. Shea's a, a primary creator. Chet is your perfect kind of like big that can kind of play with all of those guys. So like I don't really get caught up on who's the best because they're all really, really good. And in a situation where the Thunder have three of the top 10 players in the league, they're just going to be really good and they're going to kick everybody's butt. And so I don't really, I, 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 if I had to gun to my head, uh, say who's going to be the best player in the long run, I'm going to pick Shea just because he's already there. Therefore, it's a safe bet. There's a lot theoretical going on with Chet and with J-Dub at this point, whereas Shea is like already there. So he's the safest bet, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was the third best player on the team when we get into the future. That is the potential that Chet and J-Dub have at this point. Um, so I was talking about comps because I was trying to figure out a player that had a similar type of uh, uh, you know skill set that he brings to the table as Jalen Williams and and I the a comp I ended up coming up with was like a, a like a better shooting version of Jimmy Butler. Now, uh in the comments I had two suggestions. One guy said the comp you were looking for for Williams was Pacers Paul George. Another one was Kawhi is the comp for Jalen Williams. So, here's the thing. I have never viewed Paul George as the level of playmaker that some of the better wing uh, wings in the league are. And then uh, um, Jalen Williams is a much more significant driving and finishing threat than both of those guys. He averages more drives and restricted area finishes than both by a pretty significant margin. There's like a real downhill force with Jalen Williams. 
Paul George can beat people off the dribble with quickness and with his ball handling. We know that's a part of his game, but it's not like a real, real strength of his game. Kawhi Leonard brings power, but it's a back-to-the-basket post-up power. Kawhi's not really a slasher. That's not what he does. So, like, those guys can do that stuff, but I think Jalen Williams has the potential to be a substantially better driving threat than both of them. So I don't really view that as as the uh, the comp. The, the thing that I look at with a guy like Jimmy Butler is the the real like downhill, like rip through, beat guys off the dribble type of force, especially that he had earlier in his career. But I'm really curious to see where he ends up. And honestly, when it comes to pl- uh, player comps, there's no such thing as a perfect comp because every player is so unique. And Jalen's kind of unique in his own way. To me, he's almost like, he's almost, the way he has defenders on their heels actually reminds me a little bit of Russell Westbrook. And it's like, it's like he's getting into these easy pull-up jumpers, but he can make them. He's one of the best shooters in the league. And so what if he's like a bigger, better shooting Russell Westbrook? Like, wouldn't that be a crazy type of prospect in the NBA? All right, two more and then we're out of here. How much easier is the East compared to the West? The Lakers are 17 and 11 against the best teams in the league. The Knicks are 5 and 17. So the Lakers and most other West teams played six more games against good teams than the Knicks and most other East East teams. That's a massive difference. So one thing, in the Knicks defense, they've had stars injured all year. So of course they're going to struggle against the best teams. So I don't really hold them against uh, that against them. I think the top of the East is every bit as good as the West. I think the Celtics are really good. I think the Bucks are really good. I think the Knicks are really good. I think the Cavs and Magic are, you know, take them or leave them. But with the Sixers healthy, those four teams, Bucks, Sixers, Knicks, and, and Celtics, I think are every bit as good as the top seven teams in the West. Not in the standings, but like the uh, the Nuggets, the Clippers, the Timberwolves, the Suns, the Lakers, the Thunder, and who's the team I'm missing? Um, there's one in there, the one I was mentioning earlier. Uh, doesn't matter. Anyway, those teams, I, I put the four in the East on the same level as those teams in Boston and Denver, obviously on their own tier, right? But it's the bottom of the Eastern conference where the bottom just completely falls out. There's just, you play because you play teams in the Western conference twice, right? So you play 30 games against the West, you play 52 games against the East. And so you get four matchups with that shitty Hornets team or that shitty Pistons team or that shitty Wizards team, right? Like you get all of these games against bad teams at the bottom of the conference. And there's a lot of truth to the fact that most of these Western Conference teams, their records look lower simply because they're just playing better teams night in and night out. And there's no doubt that that's played a difference or played a factor into the way the season is shaped out. All right, last question. What is your take on Luka not being higher in the MVP list? I know the league is stacked with talent, but with Embiid being out of the race, I can only see Jokic being higher than him and just by a hair. With the Mavs being a top five seed in the West now, it sounds like the media can't come up with a seeding excuse any longer. Thank you for your take, and thank you for educating us fans every day. Love the content. Keep doing some great work. I really appreciate the support. Again, every time I see those comments, it definitely helps push me along. I appreciate you guys. Here's the thing. Right now, on the recent win streak, or win streak the Mavs have the seventh best record in the bas- in basketball, which is definitely in MVP territory now where he wasn't a few weeks ago, right? Totally agree with you guys there. But in the event that you're trying to make it uh, into a serious MVP situation or, or like be an MVP favorite to win, if you're not in that like upper tier, and I mean like one of the top seeds in your conference, which the Mavs are not. The Mavs are seventh in the league, but, you know, Denver's a clear tier above them in the Western Conference, right? With that being the case, Luka would have to demonstrate a substantial gap in terms of the level of play. And the truth is, as good as Luka has been, and there's a lot of Mavs fans who have been like, I saw comments yesterday like, no one's played better than Luka this year. I disagree. I think in the context of the regular season, Shea's played really damn good. Nicole Jokic has played really damn good. Giannis has played really damn good. Like, there's no, like, tangible, massive gap between the level of play from Luka and those guys. And Denver and OKC have better records by a pretty sizable margin. So, like, again, I I, I think Luka has put himself into the conversation. And I think, uh, you know, top three finishes in the, it, it, on, the, on the table here. And if he... If they go on a win streak that ends the season and Luka averages, you know, 35 a game in that stretch, then yeah, he might just smash his way to the top. But there's a reason why he's not getting buzzed as the favorite at this point. There are teams above him that have better records and that have players that are playing about as well, right? And that's just going to make them better MVP candidates uh, as of right now. Don't worry. Luka's going to get an MVP at some point. He's going to get championships at some point. I'm a big believer in Luka. 
He's only 25 years old. There's timing to this stuff. All right, guys, that's all I have for this morning show. We're actually coming back. What's the uh, the night game tonight? I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what it is. The We are coming back after Mavs Warriors tonight. That'll be fun. It's a, a, a 10 p.m. Eastern tip. We'll be coming live on YouTube right after the final buzzer. I will see you guys then.